kinds of things. We talked about immovable and movable things. We talked about the differences between personal rights and real rights. And, you know, this is all very introductory. In the next lecture, we talked about ownership as a right, and we used that as a specific example of how real rights work in the Roman and South African legal system. And then we applied that, and we took a look at uh, a very recent case about this issue, and in the context of the, the constitutional dispensation, we looked at the PISA Act as replaced by the PI Act, now that interacts with Roman law. But today, today we're talking about real rights, how they're acquired, how they're transferred, and how they come to an end. So, very broad topic, but a very important one nonetheless. So, let's start off by talking about the concept of real rights. So, what are real rights? Hmm. Okay, so, I don't know where the revision went, but let's quickly just talk about some main issues with respect to real rights. What are real rights? as opposed to personal rights. So real rights, we can say, and let me actually see if I can't quickly get this on the screen for you. Hold on. Mm. So first of all, real rights, and you might have to excuse the clicking, and I'm going to look silly for a second, because I'm going to put this on. I, I hope I'm still, uh, still not too loud or anything like that. So real rights are, first of all, absolute in nature. This is surprisingly fun. What do we mean when we say real rights are absolute in nature? It means that, quite simply, the real rights are exercised in a specific way, namely against the whole world. Personal rights, on the other hand, are relational rights, and therefore they are not absolute. They are limited, or better, better yet, we could say they are relative rights. Absolute nature can be applied against the entire world. Anyone in principle could va violate these rights, and accordingly, personal rights are the opposite. They are relative. Only certain people can violate these rights. Real rights can be exercised against the entire world. Real rights can only be exercised against specific persons. Secondly, real rights are so they're absolute in nature, and they are enforced with the real action. No. Oh. Sorry, my keyboard's doing strange things. Anyway, uh, so we talked. So they're enforced with real actions as opposed to personal actions. And because they're enforced with real actions, it means they are enforced uh, in, ter uh, in terms of real rights as opposed to personal rights. So the right has a real nature. And you'll remember we said real is from the Latin res. Okay, so that's Latin, so I'm putting it in italic. So, from the Latin phrase, we derive the word real. In other words, relating to a thing. Okay, so that's more or less revision on what real rights are. That's important for today's lecture. Now, before we move any further, I would like to encourage you, uh, please feel free to use uh, the chat if you are, you know, uh, if you want to uh, ask any questions. Uh, I have not been able to set up the chat to actually work in, uh, to show on, up on the video itself because I'm a bad person. Also, uh, I'm, 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 I, don't, I just don't deserve to be happy. But please feel free to let me know if you've got any questions. Just say hi if you're here, if you'd like to. I don't really care. Do whatever you like. And if I see any questions, I will be sure to stop and to answer them as soon as I can. Okay, so that's very basically real rights in a nutshell. Okay, um, so we need to start off by talking about the acquisition of real rights. How are real rights actually acquired? How do they come into being? And in principle, there are two ways in which this, this may occur. So first of all, we can talk about derivative methods of acquisition of ownership. Derivative. So what does the word derivative imply? It implies with the cooperation of the previous owner. So only one way for our purposes in which this could occur and that is traditio ex justa causa. Traditio ex justa causa. Now, important, that's uh, quite a lot of Latin. Uh, we're actually saving quite a lot of trouble. If you were to look at the original rule, it would be traditio ex justa causa, sed nemo plus iuris alium transfere potes quam ipse habet. So, as you can hear, uh, it's not as bad as it could be. And traditio is the way in which one person can make another person the owner of a thing. 
So let's talk about requirements. Tradito has three main requirements. Uh, justa causa, uh, nemo, well, the, the, uh, we need to look at the nemo plus juris rule, uh, rule that needs to be uh, complied with, and finally, traditio. So justa causa, compliance with the nemo plus juris rule, uh, rule, and finally, actual traditio delivery. And I know that sounds very abstract, so don't worry, we'll be going through each of these in a bit more detail just now. So first of all, justa causa, and let me just quickly get that here don't know if you can tell, but I'm quickly fixing some things. I think I might have saved the wrong version of the slideshow. So everything is basically just falling apart. But in any case, a justa causa. To start off with, justa causa, a justa causa is necessary for the transfer of ownership. Without a justa causa, you can physically transfer the object, but the actual legal implications do not follow. So let's start off by giving you examples, maybe. A justa causa literally translated, is some or other reason, causa, cause, acknowledged and used in law, a justa causa, a just cause. And so this, the classic example would be a, a contract. So for instance, buying and selling, donation or trade, all of these con contracts would be sufficient to constitute a justa causa. So ownership is not transferred if there is no contract or if it's the wrong kind of contract. You can't just have any contract. It needs to be the right kind of contract. So picture this. You're, say, leasing your house. And suddenly, the lessee decides that this is now his house. He could say, well, there is a contract, so do we have a justa causa? No, because it's the wrong kind of contract. It's for leasing. It's not for gaining ownership. And so the contracts that generally deal with gaining ownership would be buying and selling, donation, or trade. So that's the justa causa. Next up, we need to talk about uh, sorry, ah, the nemo plus juris rule. So the Latin here is nemo plus juris ad alium transfere potest quam ipse habet. You don't need to know that. It is fun, however. You know, it's a fun thing you could just show off to your parents. They're like, no, what are we paying for? Are you actually studying? could say, well, and then they will just shut up and be impressed. They might even let you, like, I don't know, um, I don't know what, you know, what you'd like to do, but maybe, maybe you could impress them enough to let them, let you do it. Anyway, uh, so the basic idea here is that no one can transfer more rights than he or she possesses. So I can't give you a right that I do not have. I cannot make you owner if I am not the owner. Make sense? So, for instance, if I were leasing a house, if I were uh, living in a house that was not mine for whatever reason, and I tried to sell it to someone else, I could theoretically conclude a contract of sale. I could even give you the keys to the house, but I would not transfer ownership because I am not the owner. So if you're not the owner, you are not capable of making me the owner. Only the owner can do that. Make sense? So remember, ownership consists of three rights. The use abutendi, utendi, and fruendi. The right to alienate the thing. The right to abandon it, to alienate it, to destroy it, first of all. Secondly, the right to use the thing. And thirdly, the right to the fruits of this thing. And these rights can only be transferred by someone who has these rights. If you don't have the right to use the thing, you cannot transfer that right to someone else, for instance. Make sense? Okay. And then finally we have traditio. Now traditio can take one of several uh, forms. Traditio is usually physical. So you could, first of all, uh, let me just actually see if I can't get the proper slide here. Two seconds, guys. Okay, here we go. So, traditio need not take place physically, though it usually does. In the broader amount of cases, it does. So, a practical example, if you are buying a bread at the store, then this is a classic example of the transfer of ownership. Spa, or checkers, or whoever, is the owner of the bread. You conclude a justa causa, a contract of sale, 
Nemo plus Uris, they are the owners, so they can make you the owner. And Traditio, they physically give you access to the bread, which you then take and eat. Make sense? So Traditio usually takes place physically, but Traditio might also take place fictionally. So whenever I, I use the term Traditio, remember I refer to delivery. It's just the Latin for delivery. So how can it take place fictionally? Well, say for instance you've got a farm. You want to sell a farm to someone. Would it be possible to physically take the farm and give it to them? No, because the farm is very, very stationary. You'll have to show them the farm. And that's a kind of fictional delivery. Another example would be, say for instance, I were hiring a car. And then, while I'm hiring that car, I want to buy it as well. Now, would that mean that I have to take the car back to the original owner so that they could give it back to me for ownership to be transferred? That's silly. So, that's a kind of fictional delivery. The owner says, okay, we give it to you. The Romans had another kind of a fictional delivery, and you don't need to know all of these. You just should know that delivery might be physical or fictional. And these examples are just here to help you understand what do we mean when we say delivery is fictional. So the Romans had this practice where they would take, say for instance, they would sell you a farm. They would take a lump of earth from that farm and just stick it in your hand, like a big mud, like a big mud bath. And then you have some dirt in your hand, and you could say, well, this is now uh, a sign that I have bought a farm. Or for instance, if we had a huge ship full of wool from Egypt, and I wanted to sell this wool to you, I would take a little bit of the wool and I would give it to you in your hand. Not all of it, just a little bit. And this is symbolic delivery. I'm delivering a thing from the broader collection to say I've given everything to you. Make sense? Okay, let's quickly check if there are any questions. Okay, when will the slides be uploaded on ClickUp? So we've actually had some internet problems. Um, so I'm working on putting the slides up on ClickUp as soon as possible but it'll definitely be before the end of today. So the previous class and this class will be up before the end of today. Okay, so don't worry about that too much. And looks like uh, that's the only questions up till now. Please feel free to ask anything. This class is going to be a bit quick because we're moving through a lot of work. So please let me know if I'm going too fast or if anything is unclear. Okay, so the next issue here would be, moving on. Uh, no, wait, wait, wait. Let's maybe just quickly talk about, so that's, the first issue here is a original method of, sorry guys, this is a derivative method of acquisition of ownership. There were several in Roman law, but this is the only one that has survived until today. So traditio ex justa causa is the way in which ownership is transferred from one person to another in South African law as well. Okay, so if we were to go back to the original principle, there are two ways in which ownership could be acquired in principle. Let me just quickly get rid of this. Again, I'm working from two slideshows here because things have just not gone my way today. In any case, in principle, there are two ways in which ownership could be acquired. So we started off by talking about derivative. But the main issue, and the one that has all the issues and problems associated with it, is original methods of acquisition of ownership original methods. In other words, if derivative requires someone to work with you, the previous owner needs to cooperate in order for ownership to be transferred from one person to another. Original methods of acquisition of ownership are basically the opposite. No one needs to help you. The owner need not be involved at all. It could be that you, you uh, on your own, just acquire this ownership without anyone helping you never mind a previous owner. There might, in fact, not be a previous owner. So let's get to that. So, hold on. Again, go. <laughs> this is complicated. Okay, so original methods of acquisition of ownership. There are several of these, and we'll be discussing each of them in turn. So to start off with, we've got prescription, occupatio, the finding of treasure, acquisition of fruits, accesio, commixtio and confusio, and specificatio. Now, of course, this looks like a lot, but they're very simple. And you should only understand the broad concepts behind these. We're not going to be asking you anything in depth 
And if we are, we're going to give you sufficient resources to understand each of these in turn. But for now, just be aware of the fact that these are different ways in which ownership could be applied. Uh, okay, so let's start off with the first one here. Mm, if this one could work with me. There we go. Prescription. So prescription could get very complicated very easily, but you only need to know that basically it means the acquisition of ownership by long-term possession. The acquisition of ownership by long-term possession. What does that mean? It means that if you keep something long enough, it becomes your property. So say, for instance, you've got a car. It's not your car. Um, this is someone's car that you've just found, say. The original owner still exists, and the original owner has not abandoned this thing. As far as the original owner is concerned, it still is his or her object and property and thing. But you've kept it so long that in practice it has become yours. So if the owner does not object, if the owner does not seek to disturb your possession, possession turns into ownership. So you, so you remember that we distinguished between possession and ownership uh, in the previous class. Possession is the physical control of an object and the intention to control that object, but it does not reflect the fact that you have any rights in respect of that object. You are not the owner. You're just in control of that object. So if I'm borrowing, borrowing your shovel, it's not my shovel, but I can use it as though I was the owner because we've got a contract that gives me that right. On the other hand, just because I'm in control of the shovel does not mean that you are suddenly not owner. So ownership and possession are two distinct concepts. But prescription means that the one turns into the other with enough time. If you possess something long enough, it becomes your property. Make sense? Okay, so let me quickly see. You said there are two ways in which ownership can be acquired. So this is a question from Ms. Singh. Uh, under derivative, uh, there's only one way. So what are the three, uh, so what are the three requirements to fall under one way being the derivative method? That is a good question. So basically, two ways through which ownership could be acquired. Let's maybe just go back to this slide here. Two ways in which ownership, by which ownership could be uh, acquired. So first of all, first of all, we're starting off by talking about derivative ways in which ownership could be acquired. And the three requirements are three requirements that must be met for ownership to be transferred in terms of derivative transfer of ownership. So there's only the one way, and the one way is called traditio ex justa causa. So let me actually just put that maybe in brackets here. Traditio is the only way in which you could transfer ownership derivatively. You could acquire property or ownership in other ways as well, though. Okay, so uh, there are other ways in which you could acquire property, namely by means of original acquisition. Derivative, the owner is working with you and transfers his rights to you. Original, there is no previous owner or the previous owner does not cooperate. Make sense? Okay, let me know if that's still unclear. Uh, I can understand why if it is unclear because this was very, uh, you know, <laughs> quick and a quick and dirty explanation. Okay, so that's prescription in a nutshell. The acquisition of ownership by long-term possession. Quite simple. Another way in which you could acquire property or ownership without a previous owner having to work with you is occupatia. So that is when there is an object without a previous owner. No previous owner whatsoever. And you take this object, and because you've taken it, because you've taken possession of it, and there is no previous owner, you become the owner by default. So, practical example. Or let's maybe talk about the concept of a thing that belongs to no one. Now, the Romans have called these res nullius. Literally, a thing of no one. And a res nullius is defined, or is, well, it, it gets its identity as res nullius, from the fact that there is no one that has the right to use abutendi, utendi, or fruendi. There are no rights applicable to this object. And so because there are no rights, first come, first serve, finders, keepers. So it's basically just finders, keepers. If you want to keep, remember the rule as finders, keepers, that's fine. So whoever just gets the thing and uses it, 
um, or just gets the thing and exercises control over it becomes the owner. So a practical example of a res nullius. Uh, you could get res nullius which were never owned. That's the first category. So it's an object that has never been owned before. So you're walking down, say, the road and there's an apple tree and the apple tree is on public land. No one is owner of the apple tree and the apple tree has an apple in it and you take the apple and you eat it. When you took the apple, you, beca you became the owner of that apple by means of occupatio. Make sense? If it doesn't, you know where to, where to ask. So that's the first category. The second category, uh, you get objects which were the property of someone, but which now are not. So if you were to say, abandon an object, remember the use of abutendi includes the right to alienate the object. So you can just leave it somewhere. Uh, you could have a newspaper, and when you're done reading it, you can just leave it on the table. Say you're in a cafe, and you're reading a book, and you decide, no, you don't like this book after all, and you just leave it on the table. If someone were to then take the book, because you've abandoned it, because you've decided, no, I do not want to be the owner of this book any longer, they become the owner as soon as they exercise control over it. That's also occupied. Okay, next. Treasure. And you don't need to know this in detail. Just be aware of the fact that this exists. So when a long-lost treasure is found by someone many years later. So there is an owner in theory. That's why it's not occupatio. It's not, it sounds a lot like occupatio, but it isn't exactly the same. So there is an owner in theory because the law of, ex of succession exists. To say, for instance, um, someone buried treasure 200 years ago. Even if they died... One of, so one of their family members or you know, whatever the case might be will be the owner because the law of succession has entered into the equation and has transferred ownership because of a, a will or because of blood relation or whatever. So in theory, there is an owner somewhere. But it's been so long and the object has been so well hidden that no one really knows who the owner is. And because we don't know who the owner is, it works a lot like occupatio. So whoever finds it, in theory, gets a share at least. Now, it, of course, uh, there were some rules that the Romans brought in that were slightly different from occupatio. If I were to find treasure on your land, the finder gets half and the owner of the land gets half. Okay. So a treasure is defined as an object which is valuable. Okay. It can't just be scraps of bones or can't be old newspapers, it needs to be valuable, it needs to have been hidden, it can't have been in plain sight, and it has to be, a, and it has to be, uh, it has to have been hidden for a long time, so that no one knows who the actual owner now is. Make sense? Okay, let me just quickly check for other questions. No, nothing else of yet. Next. Mm, if I can get to next. Okay, so just maybe a short note. Why did the Romans care about this? I mean, it seems like this is something that happens very rarely, right? Uh, it sounds like a fantasy. Oh, I just I was just walking down the, uh, the path of the woods and I suddenly found a chest full of coins. Uh, now, in Roman times, this actually happened quite a lot because you didn't have banks. And so the best way to keep your valuables safe was literally to just stuff them in a chest or in a, like a clay pot and bury them. So often when people were tilling fields or what or doing whatever, they would just stumble upon these, you know, treasures. So it was actually surprisingly common at that time. Acquisition of fruits. Okay, so we talked about this in last week. Uh, fruits are the property of whoever the owner is, or, well, technically, the person with the use fruendi, which is generally the owner, but not always. Uh, but you don't have to know when not. So basically, whoever has the use fruendi, the right to take fruits, becomes owner of that object's fruits as soon as they're produced. Acacio. Now, acacio is where things start to get a bit more complicated. So, acacio applies when one object is attached to another object. So, the practical best example here would be something like, say for instance, I had a diamond and I attached it to a ring then that would be Arcesio. It's still the same object. The ring is still a ring. The diamond is still a diamond. 
but now suddenly they're attached to one another. So the question becomes, who is the owner? And you don't need to know this, you just need to know that this is one of the ways in which ownership could have been acquired, and how it's acquired in this case is the owner of the object which gives the composite object its identity becomes the owner of the new thing. Now, it's very complicated, so let's go through that step by step. The owner of the object that gives the thing its new identity. So, if you could think about it this way, even if you take different things and attach them to one another, generally speaking, the identity of these individual objects do not change. It's one object that you modify. So if you've got a car, for instance, and you attach new tires to the car, the car is still a car. The car is the object which gives the thing its identity. So it's the main thing. That's one way to think about it. What is the main thing? If the thing's identity changes, that's something else entirely, and we'll be discussing it in a bit. Uh, but so, if you're making a ring out of gold, the thing's identity has changed. It used to be a gold bar, and now it's a ring. And you know the identity's changed because a gold bar and a ring obviously are not the same thing. You can't wear a gold bar on your finger, and you would not. They've got different uses. They've, they're seen as something different. But if I've got this cup here, and I were to attach a new ear to this cup, then it wouldn't suddenly become something different from a cup. It would still be a cup. It's just a cup with a new ear. So that's our case here. When we've got one thing that doesn't change its identity, but has another thing attached to it. And the owner of the main thing becomes the owner of the object as a whole, of the thing as a whole. So let's take a practical example. If you've got a car and we're attaching new tires, but the tires are someone else's, you, because you are the owner of the car, are now the owner of these tires as well. If, you, if you're building a house and you accidentally use someone else's bricks, okay, you become the owner of the bricks. If you're repairing a ring and you put a new diamond in, but it's not your diamond, you become the owner of the diamond because even though the diamond is worth more than the ring is, it's still not the object which gives the thing its identity. It's not a ring, it's not a diamond with a ring attached, it's a diamond ring. Make sense? Uh, okay, so this might seem unfair, right? It seems unfair. Don't worry, the Romans did have ways with dealing with this. All sorts of remedies were available. You could bring an action to force, basically, the owner to split the thing up again. So, if it's a ring, if it's a diamond ring, and you are the owner of the diamond, you could bring an action to the court, and the court would order the owner of the diamond ring to split up the diamond and the ring, and then you could just claim it back normally. Alternatively, you could claim compensation. You could say, well, this was worth 70,000 rand, and so I want 70,000 rand back. Okay, so it does, it's not as unfair as it sounds. Next, convictio and confusio. Okay. Uh, convictio refers to, and confusio, basically the same thing. It's just different terms we use for different kinds of things, different types of matter. So, as you might know, remember from grade 9 science, matter comes in basically three forms. You could make a fourth argument for a fourth. Uh, but, but in any case, you get, you get solids, you get gases, you get fluids, you get plasma. Uh, but of course, we're not doing advanced uh, particle physics, so we're just going to talk about physical, uh, touchable objects, so that's fluids and solids. And so convixio and confusio is the same thing, just applied to solids or fluids respectively. So the important thing to, to consider here is what do we mean when we say generic fluids and solids? We mean that basically we're taking two of the same thing and mix them, mixing them with one another. So you get two bottles of wine and you mix two bottles of wine. It's still wine. If you take two baskets full of wheat and you mix them, okay, that's like a casio in a certain sense, but because there's no single thing that gives this basket its identity, 
It's still just a mound of um, wheat. And there's no dominant wheat and you know submissive wheat. There's it's it's all just part of the same idea and concept. So because it's a generic thing, when we mix it, we become composite owners as well. So I own half of this pile of wheat and you own the other half of it. And then we basically just divide it amongst ourselves if we want to separate it. So again, you just have to have a very basic idea of the fact that this exists. You don't have to understand it in detail. So let's take a practical example. Um, Conmixtio would be mixing the same generic solid. So I went, I go to your house and I buy s and I decide to borrow some flour. You're not home, so I just take your flour, and when I get to my own home, I just chuck it in with my own flour. So I take your flour, mix it with my flour. That's convixtio because it's a solid. It's a solid. Uh, it's not a fluid. Confusio would be if I were to break into your house, say, and take olive oil and mix it with my own olive oil because it's a fluid. It's confusio, not convixtio. But again, you don't need to be able to separate these from one another. Uh, for now, this is actually just to illustrate the idea of the idea that ownership could be acquired either by transferring it from one person to another or by acquiring it without um, other people being involved or other people giving permission beforehand. Uh, okay, so the next example would be specificatio. So that's when one thing is used to make a new thing or when several things are used to make a new thing. So this one is actually incorrect here. It should be several. One or several things. So if you take gold and you make a statue, that's specific art here. If you take wood and you carve, a and you carve say, a bookcase, that's specific art here. If you... Let's take another example. If I were to take two fluids which were not generic and not the same, and, to, and if I were to mix them, then I would be cre creating a new thing. So if I were to take, say, uh, brandy and coke and mix them, it's not suddenly brandy, coke, which has been mixed, you know, two generic items that have been, have been mixed. I've made something new by mixing these fluids. So that sounds like it could be confusio, but it turns out it's specific art. Again, I know this is very abstract. Don't worry about the detail. Just be aware of the fact that when you make a new thing, you become the owner, irrespective of whether or not the actual owner of these things consented or even knew. So, say for instance you're a career criminal, you break into someone's house, you find an open canvas, you sort of become inspired and just paint the most lovely thing ever. That's your painting. You used his paint, you used his easel, you used his canvas, but because you made it, it's yours. Okay, sounds unfair, but again, there are ways in which this situation could be remedied. Remedy. So the owner could claim back the value of these things from you and say, well, it's not fair that you get this object. It, you know, it originally was mine. Okay, so let's take some practical examples, maybe. To start off with, uh, let's say I take my golden cup to a jeweler to have it repaired. He accidentally attaches a bronze handle belonging to someone else. Who is the owner of the cup? So, it might seem like uh, because the cup is golden and the handle is only bronze, that we're going to give preference to the cup as being the main identity. We will give preference to the cup as being the main identity, but that's not why. We're giving preference to the cup as being the main identity because a cup, if, a, if you attach a handle to a cup, it doesn't change into something else. It's still a cup. It's just now a repaired cup. It used to be broken and now it's fixed. Make sense? So we always look at the main identity. And what was this? This was Akesio. Not specific artio, Akesio. Because we didn't make a new thing. We just attached a new object to an old thing to enhance that object but but not to change its identity other example i mix two parts rum belonging to me one part lime ju juice yours one tablespoon of sugar also yours and 15 mint leaves yours to make the perfect mojito now this is a very good recipe i can recommend it which of the aforementioned processes has taken place so what is this is this 
commixtio? Well, it can't be commixtio because this is a, these are solids. Could it be confusio? It might look like it's confusio because we're mixing different fluids, but it's not because this is an entirely new thing. So this would be an example of specificatio. Okay, very abstract, I know, but confusing, I know. Just be aware of the fact that these are the general principles, that these things exist. And you'll be encountering these in law of things in your third year, and you'll be doing them in a lot more detail then. Okay, so, let me just quickly get the other slides ready. Okay, actually, I think that is it. Let's maybe just quickly talk about the most important part of this section and what's going to be the most useful for, 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 for the, part of the, the rest of this module will be the distinction between real rights and personal rights. Real rights are the right to an object. Personal rights are the right to some sort of performance by another person. So the right to a car would be a real right. The right to have someone, say, give you a massage would be a, the right to a performance. This could also include, of course, an actual performance, like, for instance, if it were an actor or a musician. A real right is enforced with a real action, and a personal right is enforced with a personal action. A real right is enforceable against any third party, and a personal right is only enforceable against that specific individual that is the other party in the contract. And we talked about real rights, we talked about ownership, which is the most comprehensive real right, and we did that in a lot of detail. But there, of course, also are limited real rights, which are very similar to a real uh, to ownership in that they give some of the same abilities to the person holding that right. But, and this is important, they're limited in that they are not as complete as ownership is. You can't do everything you could do as an owner. So an owner has more rights. And the examples here include servitudes, okay, the right to use property belonging to someone else in a very specific way. The example we gave of that last week was a right of way, so you have the right to use someone else's land to walk over, and real security, so used to secure debts, for instance in a pawn shop, B-A-W-N, again. Okay, and this then basically is real rights in a nutshell, uh, very, very tiny nutshell. The idea is basically just to give you a bird's eye view of what's happening here. So please let me know if you've got any questions. Now would be an excellent time to ask it because the formal lecture is over. I'll stick around for a second or two. But this is basically what you need to know for this section. Uh, for in terms of the exam, we're still working out exactly how that, that's going to work. But it's going to be a take-home assignment. Uh, so don't worry about, and it's not going to be like in a strict, we're going to not going to have strict time limits, limits or anything. It's going to be very relaxed. It's going to be just a normal assignment as it was from the beginning of the year. So don't worry about that. Uh, only difference is you're going to be submitting electronically instead of physically. Only difference. Uh, as you may know already, we are planning on having lectures coming Monday and the Monday after that. Oh, wha wait, no. It's the 1st and the 8th, so whenever the 8th is. Uh, and whenever the 1st is, I guess. 1st is a Tuesday. So, yeah. So the 1st and the 8th, we are having lectures. So please do attend those. Um, it's going to be a bit better, I think, than doing this distance-based education thing, because as you can see, I'm not very well uh, adjusted to that yet. So please do come, and uh, we'll see you then. All of the best, and please let us know if you have any other questions. Uh, I'm always available in my consultation hours at the phone number given on ClickUp, and uh, by email as well, and we'll be responding as quickly as we can. All the best, and have a good day.